Behold, I give you good tidings of great joy. Christ the Lord is born today. Break forth together into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people. The Lord has redeemed Jerusalem. The prophet's promises are made flesh before the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Come and worship, come and worship Christ the newborn King. Good morning and Happy New Year. Would you stand as we sing hymn number 126? And join in Angels from Realms of Glory. Good morning, everyone. I brought some name tags with me today. Can you tell me what this one says? It says my name. It says your name, too. Your name is also Rachel. All right, I'm going to put my name tag on. Okay, can we go around and everybody tell me their name? I know most of your names, but Ella, Ella, Olivia, Olivia, Ansley, Ansley, Campbell, Campbell, Rebecca. Your name's not David. (laughs) There's Benjamin and John, Rachel, Preston, Abby, Abby, Anna, (laughs) Ben, Ben, Robert, Robert, Mason, Mason, And Eliana, that's everybody's name. Do you, guys, do you guys know what's so special about names? We all have one. And they're all different, except for me and Rachel. <laughs> and, but also, everybody in this room and everybody all around the world also has the same name. And it's the name that God gives us. Do you guys know what that name is? It is, it's child of God. Can you all say what's on here with all together? Child Child of God. We are all God's children. So I'm going to pass these out, and you can each take one, and you can put them on your shirt like I have mine, or you can put them somewhere in your room so you'll never forget that you guys are all children of God. Please pray with me. Dear God, Thank you for our names. Thank you for our names. And thank you for making us your children. And thank you for making us your children. And giving us new names. And giving us new In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Tears are falling, hearts are breaking, how we need to hear from God. You've been promised, we've been waiting, welcome holy child, welcome holy child. Hope that you don't mind our manger How I wish we could have known But long-awaited holy stranger Make yourself at home Please make yourself at home Bring your peace into our violence Bid our hungry souls be filled What now breaking heaven's silence Welcome to our world Welcome to our world Fragile fingers sent to heal us Tender brow prepared for thorn 
tiny heart whose blood will save us unto us is born unto us is born so wrap our injured flesh around you breathe our air and walk our sod rob our sins and make us holy perfect son of god perfect son of god welcome to Our scripture reading today comes from the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. It is chapter 61, verses 10, then into chapter 62, to verse 3. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and the garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch burning. The nations will see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you will be called a new name, which, will be mouth, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of the Lord. Of your God. Now, I don't know about you guys, but about this time of year, every year for as long as I can remember, I have had a certain song go through my head. 1999 by Prince and the Revolution. I don't know what it is about this song. It might be its finality in, in everything or the fact that you were coming to the end of the year, but for some reason it just gets stuck in my head and I can't help but think 2000, zero, zero, party over, oops, out of time. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? All right, okay, good. <laughs> it's a reminder, like I said, of how things are coming to an end, but also about how there's a new thing that's coming. In Prince and the Revolution's case, it was life as they knew it was coming to an end, and the end of the world was coming. And it was all happening in 1999, at the very end, at the turn of the century. Now, 1999 was an interesting year. I don't know how many of you all have that fresh in your mind, but let me give you some highlights from 1999. Live in La Vida Loca came on the radio. Wayne Gretzky played his last game in the NHL. America stood still during the shooting at Columbine. SpongeBob SquarePants made his debut. John Elway announced his retirement from the NFL. 10 Things I Hate About You, The Mummy, and Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace hit theaters. 
J.K. Rowling's third book in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, came out. The Sixth Sense premiered along with Fight Club, The Matrix, and Toy Story 2. On October 12th, the sixth billionth person on Earth was born. Woodstock 99 happened. Pokemon mania was sweeping through America. And who can forget the Y2K bug? You guys need to understand the Y2K bug was nothing small in our household. In fact, I remember sitting on the back porch of my parents' house, learning about how the Y2K bug was coming and how it was going to shut everything down as I knew it. The world would no longer function the way that I had once known it to be. And soon, as soon this would happen as soon as the clocks turned into the new year. Everything was going black, one time zone at a time. It was scary, but it was also something different that was going to take me out of high school. So I was like, yeah. Now, my parents were not doomsday preppers at all, but I need to paint this picture for you guys. The readiness that took place in our house was comprehensive. My dad was a list maker, and there were lists, lots of lists. Our laundry room became this second pantry that had new shelving put in it, and on this shelving were cans upon cans of Chef Boyardee, the good stuff. SpaghettiOs, ramen, saltine crackers, soup cans. I mean, guys, we were prepared. We had, and I believe, somewhere in a closet at my mom's house, we still have a really big blue jug of water. You guys know that the kinds that you see, uh, like when you're going past an exit ramp, you know, they've got those big blue monsters. Yeah, one of those is in my mom's house somewhere. And we had filled it with water because we were afraid that there was not going to be access to any clean water with the new year. We had firewood piles in our backyard that seemed to stretch on forever. And my parents had taken money out of the ATM. And guys, we were prepared. And then the moments came. Right before January 1st, 2000, I remember the count on clock rolling back and me simultaneously waiting for the lights to turn off in my parents' house. And I waited. And I waited. And nothing happened. We went from 1999 to 2000 seamlessly as if it was any other evening. All that work for a moment that never came to be. In our Old Testament reading from this morning, the Israelites had seen defeat, restoration, and then defeat again. Judah had been conquered by the Assyrians, delivered from their hands, and then defeated by the Babylonians. And they were waiting. But the kind of waiting that they were doing was for complete restoration. They had found themselves in a place where they were kind of waiting for God's hand of deliverance. It was an already but not yet kind of place. They had already seen God deliver them before. And they were waiting for his deliverance again. It's a strange and fragile tension to be in, that already not yet kind of place. And yet there they were. And here in our reading today, we find the prophet Isaiah speaking to a hope for a new act of divine deliverance. Now, earlier in chapter 61, we see that the prophet has been called to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for the Lord, to comfort all who mourn and to instill hope. We also see the prophet speaking of righteousness, 
In fact, four out of the five verses that we read this morning have the word righteousness in them. First, righteousness is spoken to in the individual sense. 61.10 says, He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. In 61.11, So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. But the word righteousness isn't just used in the individual sense. It's also used in the communal sense. 62, verses 1 through 2, it says, Until her righteousness goes forth like brightness, and her salvation like a torch that is burning, the nations will see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. And then it goes on, And you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. What this portion of Isaiah continues to articulate is a hope for full restoration of the people and nation to the point of having a new name, something that was designated for a new position or a significant moment in life. Guys, this wasn't any small thing. Jerusalem was going to be renewed completely to the point of being called something new. What hope? What a promise being made to people that are in waiting for deliverance. And we can see this kind of hope being proclaimed through the Messiah, the King of Kings, who has come to save. We see the fulfillment of that promise in his birth. And we see Simeon and Anna and Luke 2 rejoicing over the deliverance of God's promised one. Simeon, a man who was righteous and devout, who had been waiting for the consolation of Israel, on seeing Jesus proclaimed that his eyes had seen salvation, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of God's people Israel. We see Anna, a prophetess, seeing the event that had taken place, giving thanks to God and exclaiming that it was all for who were looking for redemption for Jerusalem. And yet, even with this birth, the Messiah, much like the Israelites, we are living in a world of already and not yet. Christ has come. There has been reconciliation through his sacrifice. But there is still brokenness. There is still pain. There is still death. There is still mourning. But we have the promise that God will come again and that his kingdom will reign. And so we wait. Much like the prophet in Isaiah, the work of proclaiming God's promises is not done. As was called for the prophet to preach to the brokenhearted, to those who are mourning and in captivity, to instill hope to all who would hear, as long as we are stationed in the brokenness of the world we live in, there will be the need for us to proclaim the promises that God has made. Like the prophet, we should not keep silent. We should not keep quiet. The beauty in the book of Isaiah is that it invites us, its readers, whatever our time or place, to live in hope towards a future that is claimed and redeemed by the living God. We know that God's light has come. We know that it has illuminated the darkness. We have seen God's restorative work. And we too are waiting for the completion of God's kingdom. We have been given new names. You are beloved. You are child of God. You are redeemed. And with that name, you have been given a calling to be a light in the darkness, reflecting the love and goodness and gentleness of your maker. May this promise of complete restoration pass through you with a new calling and understanding of God's continuing work at hand and the role that you have been called to do. 
Howard Thurman, a theologian and civil rights leader, wrote a reflection for After Christmas. It's called, When the Song of the Angels is Stilled. It's something that I've been going back to this past week when I've been reflecting on Isaiah 61. It has helped to calm and refocus my spirit, especially after the rush of misplaced expectations and priorities this Christmas season. I hope that in the light of today's scripture, it moves your spirit to experience God's promise in a new light. When the Song of the Angels is Stilled by Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the heart. So on this December 31st, with the new year upon us, while you are making resolutions this evening and perhaps breaking them immediately tomorrow, I hope that you remember the promise of God's reconciliation does not end with the passing of Christmas. It continues to breathe new life to a world in waiting. And while I don't want to encourage you to go out to your local grocery store and buy all the dry goods and canned goods that you can, I do wish you the very happiest of New Year's. May God continue to shed his light on you and remind you of his calling for you to proclaim his work. And may he bless you and your family in the upcoming year. Our hymn of response an invitation is 143. If you have a decision that you would like to make, I would encourage you to come forward to meet me at the front. Would you please stand? <laughs>